Good morning, church. I hope you can hear me. Good morning, church. Uh, I hope everyone can hear me. Welcome to the Sunday service. Uh, thank you for joining us today. So I just, just before we go into prayer, I'm going to pray from the, uh, from the book of Psalms, just to let you know that we're not going to have a, a praise and worship today. Unfortunately, our leader got uh, ill and we pray for him, but we're going to launch straight into the word by Q after my prayer. Welcome to church, everyone. So I'm going to just pray from Psalms 105. Give praise to the Lord, proclaim his name, make known among the nations what he has done. Sing to him, sing praise to him. Tell of all his wonderful acts, glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Look to the Lord and his strength, seek his face always. Remember the wonders he has done, his miracles and the judgment he has pronounced. You, his servants, the descendants of Abraham, his chosen ones, the children of Jacob. He is the Lord our God. His judgments are all in, in, are all in all the earth. He remembers his covenant forever. The promise he made for a thousand generations. The covenant he made with Abraham. He, the oath he saw to Isaac. He confirmed it to Jacob as a decree. To Israel as an everlasting covenant. To you I will give the land of Canaan as the, as the portion you will inherit. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Enjoy the service today. Exodus 17, 1 to 7. The whole Israelite community set out from the desert of sin, traveling from place to place as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. So they quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. Moses replied, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put the Lord to the test? But the people were thirsty for water there, and they grumbled against Moses. They said, Why did you bring us up out to, of Egypt to make us and our children and livestock die of thirst? The Mo then Moses cried out to the Lord, what am I to do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord answered Moses, go out in front of the people, take with you some of the elders of Israel and take in your hand the staff which, with which you struck the Nile and go. I will stand there before you at the rock of Horeb. Strike the rock and the water will come out of it for the people to drink. So Moses did this in the sight of the elders of Israel and he called the place Massa and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and because they tested the Lord saying, is the Lord among us or not? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Koyo, for reading the word this morning. And good morning, church. It's great to see you again on Zoom, to see so many faces. And I just want to say sorry that we're not going to have any musical worship together this morning, even through Zoom. I know for many, uh, it's a struggle to sing 
over Zoom, maybe in your own household, whether you're by yourself or with a couple people. Uh, and obviously being together, for those of us who could be together last week, it was such an absolute joy to hear other voices around us. But if even through Zoom, you miss the chance to sing songs of praise on our, our live Zoom service, what I'm gonna do is encourage you to go to our YouTube playlist. And later Shira will put up the link to make sure you get that, but you can also go to our YouTube channel and go there and see because every week church, our worship leaders curate these songs that go with the passage, that go with the sermon for that week. And in particular, I'm gonna point out a song later that I think goes really well with the text that we're in, the themes that I wanna bring out. Well, as you saw, hopefully, Last week, whether you were in person or watched on the live stream or watched the recording, it was such a joy to be back in McKinney Hall. It felt like home. I was ecstatic. I woke up at 6.30, wide awake, just so excited. So church, I'm, I'm excited for the coming months where over the next few months, we're going to meet for once a month to just ramp up and see how well we can do it. We're going to keep an eye on what's happening on the ground with the virus, pray that a fourth wave does not come. But then also sometime in August, September, we're going to go to twice a month. And so as we keep ramping up, just stay tuned. We're going to try to communicate as well as we can with you about what to expect each time. And then as the 4th of July approaches our next in-person service, please stay tuned for information on registration. I do want to say to those of you who watched on the live stream and watched the recording, really sorry about the technical glitches. We knew that some glitches would come up, uh, but we're sorry for that. We know uh, parts of it is hard to watch, but we're also, um, yeah, we're just going to keep working on that. Our team's going to address those issues. And so thank you for your patience on that. I hope you were blessed in whatever way you were part of that service. Well, church, the next few months are going to be a big month big months of transition for the Cook family. So our twins are going off to university. And so I'm gonna say a little bit later, probably later in July, about for us as a Cook family, what this uh, Global North summer is gonna look like. We're gonna be away for some time. But university is clearly on my mind as we have our first children leaving the nest and going off to university. For any kid who has the privilege of going off to university, it can be both scary, but also a time that feels like kind of liberation to go out on your own and have this kind of independence. But obviously in that first semester, that first term, it can be really difficult. It's a time of testing information. And for me personally, I was so excited to go off to university and to become independent and to just flap my wings as it were. But it was also a really difficult time for me spiritually. I struggled in that first semester of uni. And I was wrestling with God through a number of doubts and had this period of doubt for much of those first few months. But he was so faithful to me. So I've titled this sermon, Wilderness University, God's Wilderness University, because we see that so clearly for the Israelites. They experience a liberation, a huge liberation, as they are freed from slavery. And so now as we continue in the series in the book of Exodus, we're in our second to last sermon in this series in the first half of the book, as we're approaching Mount Sinai. And they are on this three-month journey through the wilderness. And the key question in the wilderness is, is the Lord among us? or not. You heard Koyo read that. Is the Lord among us or not? Is he with me or not? That's the key question. You notice there in the text, it's not will he provide or not, although that's certainly there and we're going to see that. But our heart's cry is, is he with me or not? Is he among us or not? In John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, the second most sold book in world history after the Bible. Bunyan begins that story of the Christian life, the Christian journey with, as I walked through the wilderness of this world. It's a wilderness that we are walking through. And for us, as we look for our promised land, 
as we look toward Zion, in the meantime, in this in-between time, we are walking through a wilderness. So I want you to see here in this text, first, I want you to just hear the kind of progression of grumbling, quarreling, and testing. We're going to dive into certain passages, even backing up from where Koyo read. But just first for now, listen to the progression that you hear about the grumbling. So it starts with grumbling against Moses. Then it's grumbling against Moses and Aaron. Then it's quarreling with Moses, back to grumbling against Moses. And then ultimately we see that it's quarreling and testing the Lord. Climaxing in that question, is the Lord among us or not? That's really at the heart of it. So now we're going to look at the flow of the story. And I want you to see a couple things, both in their story that we get to see, that we get to enter into, but then also as we think about our lives thousands of years later. What I want you to think about and see is how we grumble and quarrel and how the Lord responds. How we grumble and quarrel and how the Lord responds. So the first thing that we see is water. We're going to have issues of water, food, and then back to water. Now, these are basic necessities. So Exodus 15, verse 23, when they came to Mara, they could not drink its water because it was bitter. That is why the place is called Mara. So the people grumbled against Moses saying, what are we to drink? Then Moses cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a piece of wood. He threw it into the water, and the water became fit to drink. There the Lord issued a ruling and instruction for them and put them to the test. He said, if you listen carefully to the Lord your God and do what is right in his eyes, if you pay attention to his commands and keep all his decrees, I will not bring on you any of the diseases I brought in the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. So what the Israelites are grumbling about, we have to acknowledge, first off, that it is basic necessities. In fact, when you first enter into this text, you saw there in that passage I just read, it's kind of understandable, isn't it? They're out there, they've been three days in the desert, and the human body cannot live without water, much beyond that, if at all. And so it's an understandable question. Okay, um, Moses, we're out here in the desert, there's a couple million of us. What are we to drink? But grumbling enters into the picture right away. I want to stop here and ask this question. If you're like me, do you know the difference in your own heart and your own mind when it moves from asking basic questions of the Lord and pouring out your heart and crying out to him versus grumbling or complaining or quarreling? I know in my heart when it switches from one to the other. Well, the Lord sets up a test for them. Will you complain or obey? And I want you to see right here, as you heard me read this part about these instructions and this test the Lord is going to give, I want to be very clear here, even as we approach Mount Sinai. Now, for us, we're not going to get to that part of Exodus until sometime next year. But I want you to understand the flow of Exodus that our preaching team has been taking you through to see that obedience comes after grace. Obedience comes after mercy. The Israelites did nothing to earn God's favor. He just set his love upon them. He was faithful to his covenant. And he redeemed them out of slavery with a mighty hand. Pure grace. He did the work to bring them out of slavery. And then as they're approaching Mount Sinai, he gives them this test. He's giving them, them these instructions. And the question is going to come to them. Will they complain? Will they grumble? Or will they obey? Will the obedience be a sign of trust? Because here in a few chapters, and for us sometime next year, we're going to see how he gives them the law. But I want you to understand, even now in this wilderness university, that the law, the giving of the law comes after grace. It's not the opposite way around. 
that, oh God, you're gonna give me these instructions, you're gonna give me these laws, I'm gonna follow them, and then I earn your favor. No, we see the gospel even here in Exodus where God is saying, I am delivering you, I'm redeeming you, and then I'm gonna show you how to live. So he's setting up this test for them. Well, then next we come to the issue of food. So listen to Exodus 16. In the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, if only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But you've brought us out of this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. In this way, I will test them and see whether they will follow my instructions. On the sixth day, on the sixth day, they are to prepare what they bring in, and that is to be twice as much as they gather on the other days. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, in the evening, you will know that it was the Lord who brought you out of Egypt. And in the morning, you will see the glory of the Lord because he has heard your grumbling against him. Who are we that you should grumble against us? Moses also said, you will know that it was the Lord when he gives you meat to eat in the evening and all the bread you want in the morning, because he has heard your grumbling against him. Who are we? You are not grumbling against us, but the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, say to the entire Israelite community, come before the Lord, for he has heard your grumbling. While Aaron was speaking to the whole Israelite community, they looked toward the desert, and there was the glory of the Lord appearing in the cloud. The Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumbling of the Israelites. Tell them, at twilight you will eat meat, and in the morning you will be filled with bread. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God. Now, by the way, as we're watching me present some slides on Zoom, if, if you have it on gallery view, it might be hard to see the scriptures that I pull up. So I would encourage you to put it on speaker view or presenter view or whatever it is. And I think it will be easier for you to see those slides, especially the, the text of scripture. So it be, what becomes clear here, church, is that grumbling is ultimately against the Lord. But did you notice, despite that, he hears his people and he still provides. Despite their grumbling, he hears and he responds. Now, as you look at what happens in the sequence of food, excuse me, water, food, and then water again, that it could be that these are spontaneous miracles. Scholars are actually divided on this. It could be that they're spontaneous miracles, but some scholars would argue that God has set up things that have been there for a long, long time, whether it's the tree that Moses throws in, whether it's the rock later, the kind of um, manna and quail, the way that God set up things in the natural world to provide for those things. And I think there's something there for us because in this wilderness university that you're in right now, and you're being challenged to trust the Lord, it could be that he's going to provide a spontaneous miracle for you. And that may be what you most desperately want. But it could also be that he's set things up all ready for you and when it comes along, when you stumble into that, so to speak, that you're going to see the hand of the Lord, that he has been preparing something for you for a long time. He's been caring for you for a long, long time. Well, notice in this longer passage with food that there are these instructions. So he sends them out there, and there's all these instructions about gathering. And the question is, will they follow these instructions to go out there and to pick this manna off of the ground? To trust that as they gather for each day, that they only need enough for that day because he's going to provide the very next day. But of course, some of them don't. And they hoard. It's when hoarding begins. They begin to hoard. And the next day they wake up and they're embarrassed because this Manna has turned sour and it stinks and it's full of maggots. And then there's this question of will I trust? 
And will I depend upon the Lord? And he gives them this instruction of the Sabbath, which goes all the way back to creation, of course. But here for his people in this wilderness university, he talks so much about the Sabbath and he tells Moses to instruct them. And the question becomes, will you depend upon me on this day when I'm not going to send the manna? I'm not going to send the quail. And the day before you gather twice as much. And will you trust me that it's going to be enough for the next day? Oh, I could spend a bunch of time talking here about what Sabbath means for us as busy people in this modern age. But for the sake of time, I just throw out the question, especially for those among us who are prone to workaholism. It's the most respectable of addictions. But if you can try to step out of denial and admit that you're workaholic, how does that manifest itself in the fact that you don't take a Sabbath at all? Whether it's a Sunday or a Saturday or whenever it is, are you able to take a day of rest and say, God, I trust you that it is not all up to me? The question to think about. Well, we come back to water. You heard Koyo read the story at the very end of our passage this morning. Now here, what's interesting is they don't ask for water. They demand water. They're grumbling and quarreling has led to the point where they say to this leader that God has raised up, we demand water. Give us water. Well, throughout this passage, there's this tension between who's testing who. We see that the grumbling and quarreling is us actually trying to test God, but we see so clearly that it's him who is testing us. Will we complain or obey? Like I said, I know there are times in my life, I know throughout each day, throughout each week, especially when I have seasons of grumbling, when I've crossed from pouring out my heart to the Lord and crying out to him, in childlike faith and honesty. And I've crossed the line into grumbling. And a couple years ago, there were some themes coming up in other scriptures that we were going through as a church. And I was challenged to do a grumbling fast. And it was a real big challenge, but it helped me to be mindful and to be conscious and to say, okay, whether I'm driving down the road and I'm tempted to grumble, or I'm thinking about challenges in my life, in my prayer time, or as I go throughout the day, I decided I'm going to try to go on a fast from grumbling for a month because what I noticed, church, was how much grumbling becomes a habit. It becomes part of our formation, as it were. We get in this habit of grumbling, and it helped me to be conscious, to to notice when I'm doing that, to recognize it, to stop and take it to the Lord and say, God, forgive me for my grumbling. And help me now to turn towards you. And so I've been challenged, even as I've been preparing for this sermon, to try that again. I think I need to make it a regular practice in my life. And I've noticed how easily habits are formed and how easily they can be broken. So maybe you want to try that as well. If you are prone to grumbling against the Lord, if you're prone to grumbling with the people closest to you, to consider what a a conscious fasting from grumbling could look like. I know it's a different kind of fast. When we fast from food, food is a good thing, whereas grumbling is not. But if it can help you to see, when am I crossing the line between just pouring out my heart to the Lord in honest prayer to actual grumbling? The commentator Alec Mutier says that testing God involves putting him on probation. It's putting him on probation. It's basically withholding trust, pending evidence. It's saying, God, I'm the one here that's going to tell you when I can trust you based on the evidence that you show me. I wonder if that's the case for you. I know I've seen that in my own life a lot, that I have these tangible pieces of evidence that I need for me to then say, God, I trust you. It's like a parent with a young child who is so sure that he or she knows what should happen. And especially when they're really young, 
it's actually really cute and adorable. And as a parent, you're, you're trying hard not to laugh. Maybe sometimes you're trying hard not to cry. But part of the time you're trying not to laugh because it's so adorable and how this young child is so certain that they know what should happen. And as a parent, your, your heart, even when you, when you becomes frustrating, your heart is full of love for them. And you just want to say, my dear child, if only you knew how much I see a bigger picture than you. How much of the bigger picture that I see than what you see? Well, I think that's how our Heavenly Father is with us. He is holy. He is just. He will one day judge all the world. But he is also a patient Heavenly Father who loves us. And I think there are times where just in love, it's like he wants to just wrap his arms around us and say, my dear child, if only you could see what I see. I see the bigger picture. And will you trust me? And I hope you've seen that in this passage where they are grumbling and that grumbling is turning into quarreling and God is patient the entire time. He still provides for them, even in the midst of that. And so this morning, are you asking the question, is the Lord with me or not? Is the Lord among us or not? I'm amazed at the ease with which we question God based on our own criteria. And our test of his presence is often whether he does stuff for us in our timing. Go back and read this text. You'll see how much of this is about timing. And our questioning of his presence with us ultimately reveals our lack of trust. Well, despite our grumbling, he shows that he is with us. And brothers and sisters in Christ, he shows us this most clearly in Emmanuel, God with us. That Emmanuel, that eternal son of God who took on flesh and became Emmanuel and was announced to the shepherds by the angels. Later, he would go on to be in his own wilderness and his 40 days represented in many ways those 40 years that the Israelites went through. And in those 40 days, he faced temptation. And he was what? He was hungry. Basic necessity. He was hungry and he was tempted to have these stones become bread. And he tells the tempter that man should not live by bread alone, but by the very word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. And he tells the tempter, do not test the Lord your God. Where he, where the Israelites failed, he did not fail. Where they tested the Lord, Jesus did not test his heavenly father, but he perfectly trusted and he obeyed and he became the bread of life. So listen to this passage from John chapter six. So they asked him, so they asked Jesus, what sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, very truly, I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven. It gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. How did you hear that? Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Basic necessities. He knows what you need. You may be in this wilderness period where you're even struggling with those actual tangible necessities. How am I going to pay school fees? Struggling to get food on the table. Know that he knows you. He sees you. And he will provide. I don't know how. And church, we want to come around those who are struggling in these very basic areas. And we're thankful to God for the way that we've been able to do that 
for over 30 families over the course of this pandemic. But it could be that it's not actual bread or water or, or shelter or school fees, but other things in your life that metaphorically are the bread, the thirst that you have. He's saying, will you trust me? Will you believe me? Whoever believes in me will never go thirsty. Church, Jesus was the rock that was struck. So you heard Koyo read that passage about the rock that Moses was commanded to strike and then water poured forth to provide for the people. Listen to what Paul says, commenting on this passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud and that they all passed through the sea. They were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them. And that rock was Christ. That rock was Christ. You see, Paul is taking this ancient story of the people of God, and he's interpreting, interpreting it for us now initially for the Corinthians, and by the Holy Spirit, now to us, to say that for the people of God, true Israel, who believes in him, this is fulfilled in Christ. This is fulfilled in Christ. And I want you to hear something, church. I'm going to read again the last couple of verses of this passage. And I want you to take a look at this picture as I read it and listen to chapter 17, verse 4 to 6. So then the Lord said to Moses, excuse me, then Moses cried out to the Lord, what am I to do with these people? They're almost ready to stone me. The quarreling had become so bad that Moses is fearing for his actual life. Verse five, the Lord answered Moses, go out in front of the people, take with you some of the elders of Israel and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will stand there before you by the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it for the people to drink. Oh, church, this is so deep and powerful. What Paul is talking about here, what is happening in this text in Exodus. You see, when God says, I will stand there before you, in the original language, in the Hebrew, this is the kind of language that would be for a servant who would come stand before a king, who would come stand before a master in a place of servanthood. And it's like God is saying, I'm going to stand there before you. I'm not going to just stand here so I can watch you strike the rock. But essentially what he's saying is, strike me. They're grumbling against me ultimately. All right, strike me and I'm going to provide for you. Church, this is fulfilled in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He is the rock that was struck for us. He is the rock of ages that Paul is talking about. And what happens on that cross when he is literally struck by that spear? What pours out? Blood and water. And now today, as we go through communion, as we take the Lord's Supper, Throughout our life, what do we do? We commemorate the blood that he poured out for us. That as he was struck and his body was beaten and he gave his life for us. We say, I trust you. I remember. And I put my faith once again in what you did for me. Church, we're going through a particular kind of wilderness right now. It is a university of sorts. It is a testing. And the question comes in whatever way this is affecting us individually, but collectively as a church, will we trust him? Church, the older I get, the more I walk with Jesus over 40 years now. It just seems to boil down so simply into this question from him. Will you love me? And will you trust me? Because he's saying to you, I love you. I am for you. And I am worthy of your trust. I will come through for you. And so whether it's those basic necessities 
of provision. Maybe it's a marriage relationship. Maybe it's some other kind of relationship. Maybe it's parenting or whatever other challenges. He's saying, will you trust me? So church, I'm going to pray right now for us. A short prayer before we go into breakout rooms. But I want to encourage you, if you are particularly struggling with trusting the Lord right now, you're saying, yeah, I've just, I've been grumbling a lot. Um, I, at the very core, am struggling with that basic trust. I want to invite you to just wherever you're sitting to hold out your hands as a symbol of receiving from the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I come before you right now as one who knows what it's like to struggle with trust. Having gone through my own seasons of doubt. And even this past week being confronted with just some stuff in my heart that questions my trust in you. And Lord, just as you've done for me, I pray that you would do for my sisters and brothers in Christ. And maybe even for, for some who, for whatever reason, are on this Zoom call. If they've never actually put their trust in you, that they would surrender and trust you for the first time. Trust you for that ultimate provision of salvation. That you provide the rescue plan for us for all eternity. And you've done it at the cost of your own life. So Lord Jesus, would you draw near to each one right now by your Holy Spirit to take these ancient words with my feeble words and to work deep in our heart a greater trust in you. Lord, I thank you that your word is true, that you love us, that you are for us. And Lord, to the extent that we have tasted and seen that you are good, would you remind us that we would look back on our own liberation, the way that you've brought us through a kind of Red Sea. You've brought us out of slavery to sin and death. Oh, Lord, may that increase our trust in you for every other thing in our life. We pray this in Jesus' name, the rock of ages that was struck for us. Amen. Church, one of those songs that I want to encourage you to go watch is called Kutembea Nawe. And there in that beautiful rendition by Rebecca Dawn, there's English translation, if you're not a key Swahili speaker. And basically it's this question as I'm walking with you, it raises these questions about how hard this is, but Lord, how I long to do this, how I long to walk with you. And so I hope that song will minister to you. Shiro is going to put it in the chat so you could just easily link to it and cue it up and watch it later, whether on your own, as you come before the Lord in prayer, or just worship as you maybe watch it with your family later. But right now we're going to go into breakout rooms. We're doing it at the end here. Um, if you can't be a part of it, or if you just don't want to be a part of it, we're not going to force you, church, but we invite you to, to join in. There's just going to be a couple questions that we're going to to put out there to have people share a bit in response to this sermon and response to this text. And then if people want to stick around, we got a bit of extra time. If you want to stick around to, to fellowship uh, until around 11 or so, that's fine. So Shiro is going to put up the breakout rooms and you can click enter, or if you don't want to join for whatever reason or can't, then you can uh, just leave the entire Zoom call. But church, we love you. We're going to be back next week with a live Zoom service. Uh, we're going to be our last uh, sermon in the Exodus series for now. Then we're going to have a live, excuse me, a pre-recorded YouTube sermon for the 27th of June. And then on July 4th, we're going to be back in person at McKinney Hall. So we love you, church. God bless you. And hope you can enjoy some breakout rooms.